Brucham Aboyim. Thank you all for attending. Welcome to our home. Last week we I began a lecture on uh, peer pressure, <clears throat> and I believe that it is a very important and very apropos topic, especially during our times. And last week we discussed peer pressure found in the Torah. But we see the same scenario repeated in itself in the world at large again and again, peer pressure. When we are young <clears throat> and growing up, invariably, <laughs> we have a friend that our parents don't want us to associate with. Naturally, <laughs> he's the coolest and most fun to be around. But he falls under the category that King David in the first chapter of Psalms describes and warns us about. The wicked, the sinner, and the jester. Our parents are able to see the relationship as dangerous. We just see it as fun. Many times when parents set boundaries for children, <clears throat> they rebel. It can be challenging. You know, Nancy Reagan, during uh, Reagan's presidency, would preach to young people all over the country, just say no to drugs. <laughs> Easier said than done. Peer pressure. Peer pressure is real and many times difficult to avoid or ignore. This creates a real challenge for parents. You know, let's look and see how powerful peer pressure can be. Smoking cigarettes. Everyone knows. Everyone knows it causes lung cancer. It's a killer. Yet, young people continue to begin, begin smoking. Now, there are certain pleasures in life that are forbidden, or at least restricted. Sex, <clears throat> drugs, food, how do you know what they are? Yet, when we err and participate in them, we can still have a true sense of enjoyment, nonetheless. In fact, the enjoyment is many times immediate. It may come from the act itself, or just as it states in Mishle, stolen waters are sweet. However, when it comes to smoking cigarettes, then you have to teach yourself to kill yourself. The first cigarette does not taste good. In fact, it may take you many cigarettes before you stop coughing and choking on the smoke. So the question becomes, why would someone entertain a habit that is expensive, offensive to others, and a threat to their life? Answer, peer pressure. Your friends are smoking. It looks cool. It makes you look more mature or whatever. But if you hang out with friends who do not smoke, guess what? The odds of you becoming a smoker are almost nil. Non-smokers cannot tolerate being around those who smoke. They find the whole experience disgusting. Positive peer pressure. So we as parents have a responsibility to monitor who our children are friends with. A so-called friend who is a negative influence can be compared to what we call an axe murderer who wants to chop your child's head off. You know, they tell the story of a rabbi who told this, this example to his students in reference to the evil inclination, what we call the Yetzirah. And the rabbi said, again, that the Yetzirah is an axe murderer trying to cut your head off. So one of the students asked the rabbi, what if you don't feel that way? <laughs> the rabbi said, guess what? He's already cut your head off. It's always easier to prevent a negative action than to correct the damage that it creates. As the saying goes, an ounce of prevention is worth a pound of cure. By the way, this may be the reason that the Torah does not command us to love our parents. God sent our parents in this world as spies to reconnoiter the world, <clears throat> to learn about the challenges of this world and the dangers that need to be avoided. They are here to teach us, instruct us, about the proper path that we should take. The proper path is not always the easiest one, nor the most fun. Instructing someone about what they can and cannot do, where they can and cannot go, does not always make someone beloved, at least not at first. <clears throat> so God did not command us to love our parents only to honor and respect them. And when they fulfill the mission properly, then they earn and usually receive their well 
deserved portion of love and adoration. It is a natural and decent result. But the question still becomes, since love is an emotion, how can God command us to love them? Yet we read in the only prayer that we say <clears throat> that is a Torahic obligation, a command, the Shema, it opens with the words, V'yahavta es Hashem and you shall love the Lord your God. So the question becomes, if love is an emotion, how can we be commanded to love God? You know, we are all connected <clears throat> to first man, Adam Arisham. He had no parents, and so he did not pass down to us, his descendants, the love for parents. However, his parent was God Almighty himself. So Adam, first man, <clears throat> thereby all of mankind, were created with a deep and a tangible love for their creator. God, in reality, is our father. Now, there is no command in Torah to love our children. Yet we do. This love is a fact of nature. You know, we inherited this feeling from Adam, and this was because he had children. I find it interesting that Noah was criticized for not saving even one person in his generation from the flood. But why wasn't he complimented? After all, he saved his whole family, he saved his children. And the answer given is the love of children is a feeling that is part of the DNA of all of creation. Even animals will defend their young <clears throat> with their lives. Noah did what any animal would have done. But God expects more from man, the crown jewel of creation, than he does from an animal. Now, up until the destruction of the first temple, which was destroyed for the sin of idol worship, the love for God was something that everyone could connect to. It was tangible. But so was the desire for an idol. So to speak, man's love for his wife and for a mistress. This was the primary test that mankind had to face. The temptation to serve an idol was a greater challenge, actually, than they could withstand, and it brought about the destruction of the first temple. The Talmud tells us that after the destruction of the temple, the men of the great assembly fasted for three days and asked God to give them the key to wipe idol worship out of the world. God agreed, and the desire for idol worship was removed from the world. The Talmud continues, and it says, seeing that they had God's ear, they then fasted for another three days and asked God to remove the second greatest temptation in the world, sex. Again, God agreed, and the desire for sex was removed from the world. But the sages had a problem. It seemed that even a chicken didn't lay an egg for three days. They then realized that they did not return the desire for sex to the world, that the world as we know it would cease to exist. And so they removed, probably they returned the key back to God. So from this story in the Talmud we learn just how real and powerful was the love that one had for God before the destruction of the first temple. That desire was even greater than the drive for sex, which drives the world today. One can only imagine just how strong the desire for idols must have been. So today, even though God removed the desire for idols from the world, our connection to him as our father and the love that accompanies that fact still remains. However, that love, though it still exists, is deep within our hearts. And it is only with a sincere desire that we are able to truly connect to it. So the question still remains, why did God only command us to honor and respect our parents and not love them? I believe the answer is really very logical. When someone is overseeing your every move, there is a tendency to feel anger and resentment against them from time to time. If the command was to love parents, then many children would be in a state of sin constantly. Children don't look at the world as their parents do. And the words, I hate you, are said by many children sometime in their childhood. The job of a parent seems to be to say no, if not all the time, at least often. So God, 
in his ultimate wisdom, only demands that, it, that children show honor and respect, a state of mind that they may well be able to attain. And, again, and then, when parents fulfill their mission properly, then they earn and usually receive, again, their well-deserved portion of love and adoration. Again, it's a natural and decent result. Throughout our long exile, the nations in which we have resided have tried to convince us that we should conform to their way of life and, and abandon our God and his Torah. They contend that Jewish law is predicated on majority rule. Based on that fact, they say that they are the majority and therefore we should follow them. This logic is, of course, faulty. God has given us his Torah. It is sealed and not up for debate. Our job as soldiers of God is to try to accept our orders and fulfill them to the best of our abilities. And though we try to understand mitzvot, our understanding is not the major criteria. Observing them is. So we as Jews have been compared to fish. Why fish? If a fish cannot swim against the current, it'll die. So too as Jews we need to develop the fortitude, the strength of character, to be able to fight the negative peer pressure that the secular world exerts upon us. We must be able to swim against the current of modern society. You know, this is one of the reasons that Sephardim eat salmon at all three meals on the Shabbat. There is no fish that swims against the current like salmon. The Medrash says that not only our ancestors were in attendance at Mount Sinai to receive the Torah, but the soul of every Jew that would ever live was in attendance, even converts. And there we all accepted all of the Torah. We no longer have a choice. Whatever we do or say, we were born a Jew and we will die a Jew. The only question left to be answered is, what type of Jew will we be, righteous or evil? I find it interesting that the world has no issues with our noses. They have an issue with our God. As long as Jew connects himself to his God, they hate us. If a Jew converts to any other religion, he is not only accepted, but he can reach the highest levels of their hierarchy. When their peer pressure fails, <laughs> then they revert to anti-Semitism, force, or exile. Very little in life is black and white, good and bad. Many things are gray, neutral. It is how we use the trade or item that will dictate whether it falls on the side of good or the side of evil. We've discussed many examples of how peer pressure was a negative. However, there are many other ways where it can be used as a positive. You know, in Hebrew, the words base hamedrash translates to mean a house of study. That's exactly what it is. A place where people come to teach and learn Torah. The Hebrew word for synagogue is Beis HaKneset, a house of gathering. Strange. One would have thought that the name would have been Bet HaTfilah, a house of prayer. So the name itself tells us an interesting fact about our synagogues. Their purpose is, of course, to be a place for us to formally and congressionally express our prayers to God Almighty. But maybe just as important is the fact that they serve as a nucleus for a Jewish neighborhood. It is a place where all Jews can come together to laugh, to eat, to sing, to join together as a family for joy and for sorrow. From our shul family, our personal families grow, surrounded by positive peer pressure. The example said by the clergy and respected special lay members gives the congregation guidance and direction on their journey through life. Role models, everyday people, not superstars, people that we can identify with and yet emulate. We are, we are all riding that same bus on a road leading to eternity. Let's all pray for a smooth ride. You know, they tell a story about a man who left a shul at which he had been a member for many years. He told the rabbi he could no longer put up with the noise, talking, lack of decorum. 
The rabbi tried to console him, but he was much too angry to talk to. So he left the shul and decided to pray by himself at home. The rabbi waited a few weeks and then paid the man a visit. It was a cold winter day, and the man greeted the rabbi cordially and invited him into his parlor. There, the two men sat down in comfortable chairs in front of a fire. They didn't say a word to each other, they just watched the fire burn. Shortly, the rabbi got up. The rabbi stood up and walked over to the fire and took out one single coal. He placed it on the hearth and sat back in his chair. The two of them watched as the red coal became black and then finally was extinguished. And then the rabbi turned to the man and said to him, Did you see that coal? When it was in the fire, it was burning together with all the other coals. It was red hot. But when I took it out and placed it on the hearth by itself, it died. You need to come back to shul. Again, during this time of crisis, we also need to stay connected to our shul family. We need to keep the fire burning hot and strong. You know, we need each other. We feed off of each other. Positive energy. Together with people of similar values and ideals, we reinforce all the godly qualities that help us to conduct, conduct our lives. One of us drops the ball, there is someone else there to help pick it up. We make each other better. Being a part of a shul community creates a Jewish neighborhood. This automatically gives Jewish kids Jewish friends. They marry, they, they, and then they marry Jewish kids positive reinforcement of values that have sustained us throughout the ages. If the conservative movement had to do all over again, they would not have allowed their members to drive on the Shabbat. This, more than any other factor, has led to the weakening of their movement. So, even during this pandemic, we still need to reach out to people. We need to keep our focus on connecting and sharing with our families and friends. You know, the second temple was destroyed because of the sin of baseless hatred. We need to use this moment in history to change the narrative to baseless love. And with that, may we herald in the coming of Mashiach Sakana quickly and in our time. Thank you very much for listening. Um, I wish you all a good Shabbat. Stay healthy, stay happy, stay safe. God bless you.